Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to this evening's webinar which is now pre-recorded. Um, uh, I had some issues with technology. My name is Tommy Heffernan. I'm the animated character down in the bottom of the screen here. Really looking forward to this evening's webinar. We're going to talk about innovation through the use of biological solutions. We've gone past the spring on most farms. Now we're focused on calf health, I suppose particularly in all year round calving systems um, in the UK and looking at the opportunities for precision microbes, which I'm going to talk about this evening. Um, just for a bit of background on myself, um, I qualified 20 years ago now. I've been involved in practice for 16 years. I've been very lucky to do lots of different things. Large focus during those that maybe last 12 years on large animal practice. Um, and really, I've been working as a consultant for a number of years now. But one thing, you know, over those 20 years, the most exciting project I've gotten involved in has been precision microbes. What I've seen in the last 16 months and maybe 12 months in particular has really blown my mind around the potential for harnessing the power of nature, understanding the role microbes can play in gut health. And really, I think I'll say it maybe once, twice, three times, uh, game changing products in the gut health space from precision microbes. OK. So that's a little bit of background on me. Tonight I'm going to talk about calf health. Background, I suppose, is really, you know, I often talk about um, being brilliant at the basics. Um, really fundamental to everything I do. Understanding simple biology and how we can make it better in farmed animals. Um, applying this pr principle all the way across systems. But when I look at calf health, I have six areas I always focus on. I want to just cover them tonight before I start talking about gut microbiome and precision microbes. Because I think they're really important. We often talk about the role of vaccines, worms, mineral dosing. But to me, these are the six pillars of good calf health. Consistency in these areas deliver results. I've seen that from the practical applications of investigations and work I've done on farm, been involved with farms, but I've also been lucky to travel all over the world to some of the best calf rearing facilities in the world. And these are key things they do consistently well. So hopefully people will pick up a few tips before I get into gut health and the micro. Okay, so nobody wants really to talk about colostrum again. It's sort of always brought up, but it's the building block of good calf health. It's still the big one. Um, some of the lessons I've learned, particularly in beef, cattle and sheep and dairy cows, it can be heavily influenced by feeding close up to calving time or lambing time. It can be influenced because we look at colostrum being brewed or, uh, you know, it's being developed in the other 14 to 7 days before calving time. So if we look at energy and protein in the diet, that can have an influence. And I've seen that by testing thousands of colostrum samples at this stage. And I've seen it, you know, the colostrum on the Briggs refractometer go from 21s, 22s up to 30s with enhanced feeding in that period. It can be influenced by age as well. A lot of farms will feed supplements on top of colostrum. You can't be getting colostrum right if you are using supplements, use high quality ones. When it comes to colostrum, it's the quality. It must be given quickly. That gut is like a sponge and those porous uh, and those immunoglobulins, those large molecules, those large proteins, um, it closes over. So we need to get it in quickly. Quantity also four liters and try and get that second feed in. With beef calves, it can slightly differ. With dairy calves, a really interesting one with colostrum, a tip of mine always is Focus on hygiene when you're harvesting colostrum, and um, whether it be through stomach tubes or through bottles. It's got twice the fat and protein of normal milk, meaning it's the perfect environment for bacterial overgrowth, particularly the likes of E. coli. We don't want E. coli to be the first pathogens arriving into that premature gut. When we talk about the premature gut, what gets really interesting with colostrum is some of the constituents or metabolites that are in it. Some prebiotics that I'll mention later on as well um, that are not in normal milk. Why are they there? Colostrum is priming the young gut. It's the whole area of epigenetics. That has an impact, as many of the studies show, on life, future lifetime performance. So colostrum, of course, is important for the antibodies and the immunoglobulins that it provides to the immune naive calf. And that's why we need to get them in quickly, the quality right. But it also primes the young gut. And I'm going to talk about gut microbiome later on. There's a real emphasis on, you know, the impact colostrum has there. So really, really interesting area. Next area. Hygiene. Hygiene is a really simple one. It's the second part of the pillar. Even at calving time, using gloves, navel. We all know about navel hygiene. We know it's a tube. But 
when we're looking with hygiene, one of the tips I'd give is appropriate disinfectants using the right formulations for the right challenges, be it cryptosporidium or coccidiosis, you know, using steam cleaning, time, and really using disinfectants well, particularly in sheds. Again, one of the areas I see with colostrum is a huge area for improvement is where we're harvesting and handling colostrum and milk. We can do a better job on hygiene. It really is, particularly colostrum is a great medium for bacterial growth. Okay, a very simple. I'm Tommy's talking about being brilliant to basics. Maybe I'm too. It's too simple. But time and time again, I've seen farms transformed by the focus on these six pillars. Fresh air is no different. Pillar number three. What does fresh air do? Well, it dries out sheds. It has a thing called ozone in it that can actually act as a natural disinfectant. Probably the cheapest disinfectant on the marketplace. It can be hard to get right on calves, of course, because in the winter time they're quite prone to the cold, and if we have heavy drafts blowing in on calves, it can be challenging. Um, I still think the smell is the best, you know, use of your senses when you're looking at getting fresh air right. You know, we don't want that stale ammonia smell. I find open sheds with calf jackets work extremely well because fresh air keeps them dry, it keeps the pathogen burden low. And if we're dealing with pneumonia challenges, I can tell you time and time again where we've looked at good vaccination protocols, managed some of the other challenges, but particularly focused on fresh air, it's really helped every time. Okay, feeding is an obvious pillar. If it's beef calves, genetics is highly, uh, it highly influences is that milky cow. But when we look at calf rearing, it's really important. And I look at some basic things like whole milk versus replacer. I always look at biology to give me clues about stress in the system. I always look at the solid percentage of normal whole milk being 12.5%. I look at the fat and protein percentages, and I look at how many times a day a calf suckles. Now, we must remember the further we move the calf away from that normal biology by poor replacers and poor feeding habits, Redu reducing consistency in feeding will always see challenges, particularly where we're using automatic feeders. This is where precision microbes, we look at gut health and calf performance, gets really, really interesting. Here's one of our many, many farmers now using precision microbes through their automatic feeder to every calf. And I think that's the future of calf rearing will be. Okay. This is a really simple area, but so important. If I was to pinpoint one area that keeps coming up for me, particularly with calves, is space. It's a massive factor with disease. I push for two meters squared for, for dairy calves. It can be harder to get right with sucker calves indoor, but that lie back area with space is important. Really getting space right is so important. We sort of learned some lessons around that with COVID-19 and the spread of infectious diseases in particular. So again, really simple one, but it's one of my pillars that I'll always look at when I'm examining and trying to refine and get calf health better. It's a long-term investment. Now, the next one is again a really important one, but a simple one. If it's beef calves, calf comfort, hard calving, we don't want that hard calving and pressure on the calf. Simple things like having plans. I think we focus too much on antibiotics and don't use enough anti-inflammatories with calves. Pain relief at dehorning and castration. Remember, calf comfort is about that calf being biologically, optimizing biological health, you know, particularly in cold weather. Our calves have a large surface area, meaning they dissipate heat easily. They don't have a lot of fat. So getting feeding right, I'm a big fan of more milk and whole milk, but generally feeding more of either milk replacer or whole milk can really make a difference in cold weather. So getting those simple things right, those six pillars, if you can be consistent in them, we can really deliver value around calf health. When I visit farms, this is my seesaw principle. I'm always thinking, when I look at an infectious disease, about how I can improve immunity and reduce down infection pressure. That balance, so improving immunity and reducing infection pressure. Infection pressure is the level of bacteria or pathogens we see. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. The future of farming. 
It's very uncertain. There's lots of challenges. But I think we produce high quality animal proteins and we must understand the value of the food we produce. And I've often heard it said, and it's a belief of mine too, that we're not producing food or commodity. We're producing human health foods. And so how we do that is really, really important. Um, the reduction of antibiotics is a big story. When we look at gut health and immunity, um, I'll talk about some of the impacts that precision microbes is having and a positive impacts we're having there. We're talking about sustainability and the future of food. Well, what a better way to be sustainable than harness the power of nature to deliver results for better performance and optimal health in our calves. The gut microbiome is a huge area a huge area in animals and humans. It's an area of research that really is at the cutting edge and will be for the next 10 years. Harnessing the power of nature, that's an interesting concept I want to come back to. Okay, when we talk about beneficial microbes, when I talk about microbes, what am I talking about? I want to talk about viruses, beneficial bacteria, protozoa, fungi. It's actually, they're all around us. And one area that starts and we're really important is in soil. So the root of the plant produces 30% of its energy through the root. That's to feel the, feed the ecology and the micro and the beneficial microbes all around the root and plant. You know, playing a couple of key roles, very similar to what they do in the gut health of our animals and ourselves. We think about our animals, we're often not, often not feeding our cows and our calves, we're feeding the microbes and the billions and billions of different bacteria and fungi in their digestive systems. And it goes all the way to humans. Our gut microbiome, our gut microbes are really important to health. We look at some of the challenges around processed food and chemicals and lifestyle that have impacted the gut health and gut microbiome and this area of interest because of the massive increase in chronic disease, leaky gut, inflammatory bowel diseases. It's really interesting when we look at healthy digestive tracts and how we can impact them. So beneficial microbes, good microbes, have a huge role to play. My interest came actually from being in grass-based systems at practice here in Ireland and looking at some of the mineral issues I was continuously seeing. And it brought me all the way back to soil health, all the way back to the microbiome of the plant and the root and mineral absorption there. I was also interested in gut microbiome for my own health. And when I look on the farm, I was looking at inflammation. How can I reduce inflammation? Instead of thinking about disease all the time, what makes animals healthy? How can I focus on that? I know stress has a huge impact on the pressure and diseases we see at farm. I know by optimizing biology, I'll get better results. I was very focused on that when I did a Nuffield farming tour or scholarship in 2018. When I traveled the world during my Nuffield, one of the interesting things is I went into research center after research center and got to speak to people in research, not just in Ireland, but around the world, one thing that came up very commonly was the gut microbiome. So it piqued my interest to be involved now for 16 months or more in this area has been absolutely fascinating and really at the cutting edge. And when I look at some of the challenges around, you know, the idea of synthetic biology and what we can do and do on farm in sustainable systems, we produce such a high quality product. So it's added an extra layer to the arsenal of ideas I have for the future of farming. Okay, some definitions now when we think about gut health. When we think about microorganisms, it often maybe elicits a, a fear of a bad, something bad, you know, bad bacteria, viruses. But when we actually think about microorganisms, they're all around us. They're viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoa. Um, and most of them are beneficial and most of them are harmless. But when we have a collection of these microorganisms together, that's what we call a microbiota. It's like a community. When we talk about a microbiome, and this is very important when we think about gut health, a microbiome is a collection of microorganisms working together with a functionality. And this is really important in the gut health of our calves. When we think about a healthy gut microbiome and its role in performance and health um, and the reduction of disease. So a healthy gut microbiome is really, really essential. I'm gonna use these little animations up here, these green animations for our microbes throughout the presentation. Okay, I'm gonna take you back to an interesting story. In grass-based systems, one of my first, uh, one of my many puzzling challenges that sort of, 
I would say irritated me over the years because I couldn't find an answer to it was cows eating stones or a conclusive solution. I knew how to treat these cows, but what was the underlying issues? Um, these cows were eating stones for a number of reasons, primarily low phosphorus, low sodium, or maybe low fiber in their diet. But I increasingly saw a, pro a problem year on year getting worse. And it was only till I came across the Christine Jones work on the phosphorus paradox and really understood the role again of our soil microbiology and the role of microbes in the digestion and utilization of minerals at plant and root level that I started making sense. And I started reading about the soil microbiome long before I really dug into the gut microbiome. But interestingly, at root level, um, these microbes have the similar, a similar role. They're involved in nutrition of the plant, immunity, and this idea of competitive inhibition, where they're competing with harmful pass, pa, 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 pathogens even, and pests. So it was interesting. My role with, the, so it, with microbes started with cows eating stones. Work from Alan Savory and others has made me interested in this area of soil health and the microbiome. And I think a lot of the future of farming will be focused more and more around soil health, how we grow our forages, how we feed our animals. And I think that could be linked all the way to the gut microbiome and human health. But that's a topic of interest to me for another day. We're going to focus now on calves. Okay, just before I get to calves, I want to talk about Hippocrates. Well, you're saying he's jumping all over the place, but Hippocrates said many thousands of years ago now that all diseases begin in the gut. And he wasn't, he was well ahead of his time in his thinking, but he wasn't far wrong. It's a huge organ in our body and it's the mucosa that it's exposed to the outside world. It's got 70% of the immune system. So yes, all diseases begin in the gut, but I'd like to flick Hippocrates statement and say, actually, all health begins in the gut when we look at using products like precision microbes. When we look at oral antibiotics and calf scour, continuously we see a reduction in their use, but really I want to see them stopped completely almost when we think about calf scour. Particularly when we see the treatment of viruses, uh, pathogens or, or, or other parasites, the need for oral antibiotics isn't really there. Now, I'm not saying calves don't get injectable antibiotics or we're removing antibiotics completely, but I see a time where oral antibiotics are going to be really frowned upon because we have billions and billions of bacteria in the gut, most of them good, and we have these antibiotics going in and killing the good, the bad, the indifferent, all these bacteria there really not helping clinically. Where we look at precision microbes, as I'll explain later on, we are seeing a real um, alternative gut stabilizing product, particularly where calves have diarrhea. If in beef calves, we've seen so many vet practices here in Ireland replace maybe traditional antibiotic treatments with now a gut stabilizer to just delivering far better results and a far more sustainable solution. So really exciting for me as somebody who's been involved in the antibiotic reduction piece on farm at a practical level for many years. Okay, we'll think about the gut microbiome and calves and our cells and other animals. What, what are the core functions of these billions of bacteria working as, a, as almost an organ? Well, they're involved in metabolism and digestive health. They're involved in immune modulation and regulation of the immune system. And they're also competing. We often have this idea of good and bad bacteria. Bacteria compete with each other. And if we have a stable and healthy population of bacteria, well, they can prevent the overpopulation or pathogens coming into our digestive tract. Those innate immune uh, defenses have enabled uh, the development of our species and animal species for millennia. And none of us would be here without that. So the gut microbiome is a fascinating area. When we look at some of the challenges that may be in humans and animals and intensive livestock systems or modern life that challenge that, we could see the value and the role of beneficial microbes being given orally to help supplement that better gut health. When we think about immunity and the gut, we think about the calf. 70% of the calf's immune system is in the gut. Uh, we often hear that said, but what does that actually mean? Well, if we look at our lymphoid tissue, our white blood cells that make up the core of our immune system, when we think about where they are, well, we look at them primarily in the digestive tract and the lymph system. It's the gut-associated lymphoid tissue which makes up over 70% of the calf's 
overall immune system. This is mucosa in our digestive tracts of our calves that expose to the outside world and is fundamental. When we have an, a healthy gut microbiome, we have a healthy immune system, we have good immune regulation. So we can see the importance of this and regulating that. And where we have disease and issues, why returning normal function as quickly as possible is really important. Don't worry too much about the detail here. But the one thing when I started studying this, and by the, I, I really started studying the gut microbiome because it's fascinating. But a very visual image that I got at the beginning was this one layer of cells between the digesta and the lumen wall of the, the uh, digestive tract. One layer of cells separating out all these white blood cells, um, all these inflammatory cells, all these immune cells. And if we think we've infection or inflammation and damage to that, the impact it's going to have on our immune systems. So we want to really minimize digestive issues because obviously we can, they can lead in some extreme situations to diarrhea and damage, but they can have a real impact. Even mild nutritional scours or upsets on calf performance. And that's what we've seen, particularly where I'm focused now on uh, in all your round calving systems, is better digestive health, better calf health performance, minimizing upsets because what we're going to see then is better immune regulation, uh, calf performance. That's what we're seeing from all our trials. It's not just gut-based. This is probably, I suppose, more relevant than other species. That gut and brain is linked. All our happiness hormones are in the gut. All our neurotransmitters are there. We've all had that gut feeling, the gut mammary reaction. One of the areas where we've seen uh, across species um, where we've regulated gut health consistently, be it horses or dogs, cats, or cows that are different formulations. People comment on the coat. Uh, as many a farmer has said to me here in Ireland, the shine off those calves' coat that have been on the products is something that's very visual. These are very visual products, and I explain why they're working. Um, what's interesting to me is the gut lung access, some of the research that's coming out on particularly viral diseases, and the gut microbiome and its role uh, in production of metabolites that are going to the lung. So really fascinating um, that our gut and our animal's digestive tracts are linked to so many other organs. Okay, let's talk about probiotics. Okay, when you, I'm one of those people that you have to, I'm going to have to get the history of something. And one of the things when I was reading about probiotics and where they came from, you can go right back to Greeks and Roman times where they were actually uh, carrying milk in leather satchels and that milk fermented and they realized that it had health properties. But it was this guy, a Russian scientist, Ilan Mechnikov, who looked at, um, he, was got, he won a Nobel Prize for his work on the innate immune system. He then went and looked at the aging process. And he found some peasant farmers in Bulgaria that were living to extraordinary ages, centenar centenarians. And he wanted to look at what are their commonalities, what was their success stories for living so long. And what he discovered were they were drinking fermented milks, a lot of fermented milks. And he discovered the first named probiotic that I could find in history, which is Lactobacillus bulgaris. We've all now become a little bit more familiar with probiotics. Although I would have to say, like many people, I was skeptical about probiotics. We know about live cultures. A lot of these can have, you know, be quite high sugars. A lot of people are now drinking kefirs, etc. There is something in it. I knew there was something in it, um, but I wanted to know more, and I wanted more consistency in the results. Certainly, when I was using these products. But it was Eli Mechnikov that was one of the first people that looked at the role of beneficial microbes really in gut health. Okay, so when we look at using beneficial bacteria or beneficial microbes and probiotics, when we're trying to administer these, what are we trying to do? We're trying to mimic the, mimic the functions that the normal, good, healthy microbial uh, uh, bacteria are doing in gut health. So we do say, well, well, why do we need any probiotics in humans or animals? Well, we do see that the challenges of diet, stress, the environment, they're all changing the gut microbiome. So if we can manipulate that and help and enhance it and show better results because of it, of course, probiotics and beneficial bacteria have a massive role to play. But that's why I started with my six pillars. We still are always looking to do the basics well, as well as you know, giving probiotics, we want to get the foundations of our calf health systems right. But when we're using probiotics and beneficial bacteria, we're looking at enhancing, improving digestive function, which in all your own systems is really where the benefit of probiotics is. We also want to regulate immune function. I'll explain how that's done. Um, 
Also, we want to look at this competition with pathogens. So when we are using good bacteria, they have that ability to compete with bad pathogens and harmful pathogens, particularly in our young calves that are immune and naive and, and, and at more risk. Okay, so here is the precision microbes range. Tonight I'm going to be talking about the calf range. There's two um, sizes. There's the one liter um, pro and postbiotic uh, dietetic liquid, and then we have our 10 liter complementary feed as well. Now, any farmer who's been using the product in any sort of way will quickly move from the one liter when they see the product working to the 10 liter, especially when we're looking at more long-term use. Of all the years, I, I qualified 20 years ago. Uh, I would consider myself a very honest person. Um, I'm always trying to do my best. I don't always achieve those uh, results, but I'm driven by doing the right thing and doing a good job consistently. And I've been extremely lucky to be involved in exciting projects. I have to say, I've never seen market feedback um, from a product so early and so quickly. And to be on the right side of history, as I talk about, when we look at some of the challenges there around sustainability, to have a natural product is really changing the game around gut health. And very early on in the trials that I was doing, um, there's no magic products, I know that. But to have a product that works so effectively, consistently, and people see those results has been a dream come true for me professionally. Okay, enough about uh, enough soapbo soapbox, uh, Tommy. Let's get back into the details of why this product works. But it's been extraordinary to listen to the farmer feedback uh, from the product and really exciting uh, uh, as well. Okay, I want to talk to you now about some more detail. So when we look at beneficial microbes or beneficial bacteria, we talk about using probiotics. And this is really important. I mentioned colostrum at the start and the, the building block. That has, actually has some really interesting prebiotics in it. Uh, Manoligosaccharides, fructooligosaccharides, that are actually in much higher concentrations of colostrum that aren't in milk. And they're there to actually prime and feed beneficial microbes there. So we have prebiotics, which are like the feed for bacteria, which can be fiber, microbiome associated carbohydrate or, pre or oligosaccharides or other things like that. They are the food source for the good bacteria. When we look at good bacteria and we're looking at supplementing and we talk about probiotics, they're like factories. These good bacteria or probiotics are like factories. Now this is where it gets really interesting. Those probiotics produce metabolites. Okay, the bacteria themselves are pretty just functional. They produce metabolites that act at gut level. These metabolites are butyrate, short chain fatty acids, tyrosins, bactericins. These are really the metabolites that actually do the immune and digestive function and immune modulation that can actually, the hydrogen peroxides or nitric oxides that can inhibit other pathogens. These metabolites are the postbiotics. This is only a new term recently, only 16 months ago, this term has actually been developed for these metabolites. But it's one of the real exciting areas. So we think about prebiotics as the feed for the good bacteria. Probiotics are the good bacteria. And the good bacteria producing these metabolites that act at cell and gut level are postbiotics. We've got a liquid pro and postbiotic solution. First to market as far as I can see. Um, and really, I think we're gonna change the game because of what we're seeing. There's a real important part to that. So when we look at prebiotics, they're the yellow. Probiotics are these green bacteria. The red are the postbiotic metabolites for just for um, animation purposes. It's the postbiotics that act at cell level. So if we go down to the gut here and we look on the right hand side of my screen is your normal healthy gut. The cells are lined up. There's no leaky gut. There's a lovely mucin layer on top of it produced by the goblet cells. Nice immune regulation. When we look at healthy gut, it is the good green bacteria producing the metabolites, the things like short chain fatty acids, which actually regulate normal um, gut function. So it is still the metabolites, even in a healthy gut that are essential. The bacteria themselves are important in the gut microbiome, but it's the metabolites that regulate cell function. Now, when we go to the middle, we have disruption and damage, be it through pathogens or stress or some other factor. Well, then it is still the metabolites that are needed to return normal function. Um, repair damaged cells, regenerate new cells, get more mucin production in here, just regulate immune function. Uh, in real chronic cases, we can see the role of metabolites as well. 
Um, so it is the postbiotic metabolites, the key message is they are the ones that act at cell level to regulate health, a healthy gut or return normal function. So there's a big difference when we look at um, the bacteria, um, probiotic bacteria that are in the marketplace. So ours is a pro and postbiotic. So we've got the live bacteria and their metabolites in our liquid. Most are just probiotics in the market. Some formulations are prebiotics, which are the feed. So we're a pro and postbiotic liquid. And why is that making a difference? Okay, before I get there, I have to talk about our Rambo of probiotics, our bacteria, Enterococcus fecum, NCIMB 10415. Uh, a very unique microbe um, that's been well researched over decades, a safe microbe. Um, and this particular microbe is um, why we're licensed as a probiotic. All the research has been done. And we have Enterococcus fecum, the live bacteria in the liquid, plus all its metabolites. It's the probiotic and its metabolites, the postbiotic, but a really interesting microbe. Huge amount of research done on, on calves with this particular microbe. Okay, just when I talk about postbiotics, how are they produced and how do we, you know, how do we culture these? Um, very unique science and you know development over the last decade and longer has gone into this to understand that bacteria, even good bacteria, go through a lag, a log, and a stationary phase where these bacteria hit a certain stage where they're producing their metabolites. And that's really important. So this purple triangle here is the process, is the substrates we use to culture the enterococcus fecum to get it to its log phase where it's producing metabolites in the liquid. So in these bioreactors, we have got these billions and billions per mil of live bacteria, but all the metabolites, uh, postbiotics in the liquid as well. Why is this relevant? Well, if we look at most, if not all bacteria, or uh, all beneficial microbes or products in the marketplace, they're freeze dried, they're powders or paste. And that's commercially much easier to make because you can reduce down the size of your product. You don't have to worry about shelf life and it makes it maybe an easier product to administer a powder or paste. But this is what they look like under electron microscope, uh, freeze-dried bacteria. And if you look up here, these bacteria have to go through that phases of switching on again until they're producing metabolites. Whereas in our liquid, we've got the bacteria in their log phase producing the metabolites or postbiotics. So that's why we're a pro and postbiotic liquid. So that's the difference between us and paste and powders in the market. That's why the liquid, uh, and I said very early on as a consultant to the company, I think you could change the whole market. Okay, so in one, uh, what does that mean? Well, if we think about having all the good bacteria and their metabolites, the probiotics and the postbiotics in the liquid, and we administer them, what are we going to see? What's the first thing we were seeing with calves in the Irish situation with diarrhea or scours are recovering? Well, we know the metabolites are key, like butyrate and other short chain fatty acids to help recovery and gut health. Well, we were seeing speed of action. We were seeing return to normal fecal consistency and health in calves. We look at all the impacts it can have on metabolism, immune system. There was a real response to these because of the postbiotics. If we look at some of the challenges the freeze-dried products have, be it paste or powders, well, they have to switch on. They, you know, they have to survive. We have ours in a live dormant stage in a liquid acidic medium. They're acid adapted. They have to survive the freeze-dried. And if you look at Cows with diarrhea and increased gut transit time, there's some real challenges. And I suppose it's been very good for me because we've been using products that people are seeing a response to, and it's down to the uniqueness of the pro and postbiotic liquids. There is some very unique science around how these are cultured, how they're adapted. One of the formulations has taken 12 years to develop. Um, fascinating uh, work by the researchers behind the scenes. And, you know, it's really, really, sh we're seeing the results on farm. Okay, I just want to explain again about the postbiotic metabolites. So if we look at, at cell level, if we look down at cell level and we look at the gut and we look at one metabolite, butyrate is produced by good bacteria, um, a short chain fatty acid is responsible for cell integrity, the production of mucin by goblet cells, really uh, involved in immune regulation. But when we look at a damaged gut, when we look at um, something like rotavirus and calf scar, we look at the role of butyrate in its, in its production of cytokines that return to normal function, how important a product like this can be with calves recovering from calf diarrhea and why gut stabilization, uh, particularly with like Enterococcus fecum, is licensed for this. It's really fascinating. But it's the metabolites that actually act at cell level. 
Okay, I'm going to take a pause here for a minute now because one of the reactions I have got has been the idea of alternative medicines. And I can see why. I mean, probiotics have been challenging over the years that people uh, have, are, can be dismissive of you know, natural solutions, beneficial microbes. Um, but I want to draw people's attention to two postbiotics that people might know. In the middle is penicillin rubicans. That's a fungus. And actually, penicillin was a metabolite of that fungus, or a postbiotic. On the right-hand side is Satoshi Omoro, a Japanese professor who was in a golf course in Japan and discovered a bacteria, a streptomyces bacteria, that was producing a metabolite that later became known as ivermectin. Two metabolites, postbiotics, that have transformed uh, human and animal medicine. Um, I've seen environmental microbes, I've seen slurry inoculants, I've been working with silage inoculants from precision microbes. Because of metabolomics and our understanding of how microbes work, we can change the game. And to be on the right side of history, to use natural solutions in here, it's dismissing alternative medicines. This could be, and I think for me certainly, will be the future of how I'll be positioning the rest of my career. Because I think I'm providing not just somebody talking about solutions, real solutions for farmers. Uh, I spoke to a farmer only two weeks ago who spoke about 75 heifer calves that were recovering from diarrhea. He talked about his traditional treatments that he might have used in the past, which involved oral antibiotics and kale. He went in with precision microbes uh, early, he gets get some rehydration therapy, and he could not get over the reaction. Not one antibiotic, not one kaolin therapy that was just going to coat the gut and maybe dry up. It was a biological solution for active repair and active gut stabilization. Okay, come after soapbox, Tommy. Let's get back on track. When we think about the uses of probiotics and postbiotics, certainly in seasonal calving systems like we have here in Ireland, there's a bigger challenge with diarrhea because we have big calf numbers coming. Mightn't be as big an issue in all year round systems, but we still have underperforming calves. When we look at dairy to beef systems and we look at calf diarrhea and stress in general, whether it be from pathogens or even mild, it's having an effect. Uh, in severe cases, of course, mortality costs, welfare. We have an eight to nine fold increase of other issues like pneumonia. We have morbidity, we have the risk of using anti more antibiotics, we have zoonotic risks from things like cryptosporidium, etc. An average daily gain is critical KPI for our young calves. Future lifetime performance has been linked to colostrum feeding, early lifetime feeding. So having better gut health, better average daily gains makes complete sense. This is much more than just calf diarrhea or its prevention. When we look at risk factors around the calf and maybe in the diarrhea side, remember I talked about um, the seesaw principle. Um, I still have a very simple, uh, systematic way of looking through systems. I look at immunity, I look at infection pressure, um, and I look at the system from pre-calving all the way up to weaning. I look at the things that I mentioned, my six pillars. I know that pathogens like calf uh, rotavirus, a hundred can be ingested and millions can be produced, meaning there's a massive multiplication of, uh, effect. So I want to look at immunity and I want to look at infection pressure. So when we look at what can we do to improve immunity, I talked about the six pillars, feeding the cow for better colostrum quality, getting the colostrum in quickly, hygiene, space for calves, taking pressure, even when we handle calves. I think what gets really interesting is where you put precision microbes, oral, pro and postbiotic liquids in uh, on long term use and we look at gut health and immunity. I think it's a massive opportunity and we're seeing those results on farm. We have to look as well at infection pressure, that's hygiene, right back to the calving pins, calving time, feeding equipment, calf sheds fresh air, equipment, everything has to be clean. So that's the systematic approach. And you know we're, we're looking at precision microbes, better digestive health, immune function, uh, better immune function. That's where we're positioning the product in long-term use, particularly in all year round uh, calving systems or we're looking at dairy to beef systems as well, where people are rearing calves. Again, with our beef calves and our calves, maybe that we do see calf diarrhea, we still are going to see it and we look at our traditional calf scar treatments. And again, we, you talk to your own vet about this, where you know you look at individual calves, we look at rehydration therapy, but we look at 
uh, damage to the digestive system we look at gut stabilization and remember i talked about those metabolites being key uh, part of that those postbiotics you can see why uh, a licensed gut stable there like uh, that contains enterococcus fecum ncimb 10415 in its live dormant phase with all its metabolites um, has one thing that was very apparent from the beginning the speed of action is a gut stabilizer because of the postbiotics it's 60 mils orally twice daily for three days as part of supportive regimes and this is where i believe that every farm should have a liter of precision microbes pro and postbiotic liquids there because the sooner you get in with your precision microbes gut stabilizing product the quicker you're going to see a response um, and, and i think it's an incredibly effective gut stabilizer and that's where it's been used in beef and suckler herds is having it there as part of that where you do see calf diarrhea in young calves but also where you see damage from coccidiosis or other issues if you're looking for something to stimulate and help calves recover i think this is an ideal product incredibly effective is the words i'd like to use there of time and i'm conscious we're I'm going on a little bit longer maybe than people expected but stick with me we've got another 10 minutes and really this is the practical application the rubber meets the road and um, I suppose the second area I like to look at with calves is particularly dairy calves where we're feeding milk and we look at group treatments maybe following scour following coccidiosis issues or other challenges we'll see where the, maybe the parasite like crypto or coccidiosis has been treated and we're looking to stabilize the gut we look at viral or bacteria this product on its own as a gut stabilization for groups of cats is really really effective and it can be fed in milk one of the things i've seen at the beginning of the trials is all the farmers were, re were using it orally uh, on groups of calves daily is by the third or fourth day the farmers consistently said to me that they develop a taste for this product and they do they like the taste so no issues with palatability um, so this is where the value of the 10 liters becomes apparent you can feed it in milk and what we're doing with groups of calves um, you know that are just recovering or um, that we want to or not happy with it's 50 mils orally in milk for five to seven days and that's where in the Irish market we've seen a huge takeoff in the product in our seasonal systems um, where we saw the challenges of calf diarrhea or scour but this is where it is in all year round systems and dairy to beef systems. This is where the high volume usage will really deliver results. It's better calf performance. Remember, a healthy gut microbiome will have better digestive health and metabolism, immune function, and competing with pathogens. So we know in intensive systems, we can never match the bi completely the biological needs and there is more infection pressure. So when we use pro and postbiotics, we're enhancing that gut health to deliver better results. We're helping that young calf with some of its main challenges in early life. Dairy to beef, again, we were buying in calves. So we have a large dairy to beef trial um, ongoing in the UK at the moment. We've done several of them in Ireland and we've seen improved average daily gain across them with treatments, control groups, uh, double buying controls. So what we've looked at is there's been a number of factors but it, continuously we're seeing uh, average daily gains they have been as low on 30 on some farms but as high as 200 grams per day on some and there's been other management factors involved there but hugely consistently and i'm just finished a, a student in waterford it here finishing a thesis on um, postbiotics and did a, a control and treatment group and again these are appetite particularly where calves are coming in appetite vigor uh, fecal consistency just the general health of calves you'll see the testimonials on our website if you're somebody who's on social media you might have heard of precision micro because farmers are genuinely saying what they're seeing um, huge improvement in appetite and arrival meal intakes as well across our studies have been increased in the calves um, on precision microbes reduction of calf scars on a lot of studies it was hard to measure it um, consistently but we've seen a reduction we could really min min look at antibiotic usage and there was a minimum on across all our studies of a 30 percent reduction um, on the treatment uh, groups with our precision pro, pro and postbiotics so you can see the role in, in dairy to beef and dairy calf systems is really around better calf performance better gut health again any periods of stress will impact gut microbiome in humans and animals so we're seeing recovering from other conditions 
like coccidiosis, pneumonia, poor drive in general. Um, I think uh, even some farmers and dairy to be systems are just using the products for the first five days um, and that's enough for some people but I think the real opportunity is in long term use. But anywhere there's a period of stress you're going to see a better uh, and a benefit from our products particularly maybe calves have gone off their appetite and other things. Vets are telling me of all these uses they're seeing with the products but they have one thing in common the calves are under stress. Okay, and again, this is just our most recent calf trial. Um, so we've done a lot of calf trials last year. We have a large UK trial coming through to fruition in the next three weeks. So hopefully we'll be looking and publishing the results from that as well. Um, very interesting, 100 grams a day. Um, in this particular study, the calves did 200 grams a day in the last four weeks. You know, appetite was improved. We did scoring, a lot of scoring, weekly scoring, general demeanor, eyes, ears, etc. Meal consumption was up. Antibiotics were reduced across all calves in fairness, but you know, none in the treatment group. Um, coat condition was improved and disease incidence was lower in our treatment group. So consistently we're seeing from our trials better, better performance. And that's where I think the calf product is really going to play its role in all year round systems, where there's less maybe infectious pressure, but there's still the normal stresses on the gut we see in any intestinal system where we're rearing calves. It's just a normal part and parcel. And we're using the pro and the postbiotics to regulate that digestive health. So we've seen that. I've sort of gone through it. We've got, we've got really good results. I mean, this is, this is an earlier slide from last year. Um, what's been interesting for me on the beef side of it as well is replacing oral antibiotic therapy and vet practices uh, as a thing in the past, particularly when you have a licensed gut stabilizer that's delivering better results. Um, that's not to say your vet mightn't use antibiotics, injectable antibiotics for other conditions, but particularly where we're looking at gut stabilization, along with other supportive treatments, we are delivering results. Okay, long-term usage is where it really is at. Probios, uh, probi probiotics come from the word probios or the Greek word for life. Um, this is what this product was actually designed for. It's a liquid to go through feed, better gut health, digestive function, and of course, better immune regulation when you've got better digestive health. The dose rate for long-term use is 30 mil daily for the first seven to 10 days. Then different people have used different um, ways of feeding depending on the system. What we started with was 30 mils three times weekly, and that can go up to three weeks of age, up to weaning or whatever period of time people decide. Um, I mean, what we've seen now in our automatic calf uh, feeders where people are putting in the liquid is they're going 30 mils a day for the first seven to 10 days and then 15 mils a day um, after that. And that's working on farms as well. So um, really interesting when we look at long-term use can be given from birth with colostrum or on straight after arrival in dairy to beef systems. And I feel this is where the product will really go into its own over the next while. And in several markets now, we're hearing that feedback um, beyond Ireland, which is really, really good uh, in calf rearing and dairy farms, particularly with long-term use. Still in beef calves, its role is probably in gut stabilization following upsets or calf scour. So three dosing regimes, the recovery from scour, it's licensed gut stabilizer, um, 60 mils twice daily along with other therapies, bottle of this on your farm, speed of action, early intervention is key. Every farm should have a bottle on their shelf uh, of the one litre. When we look then, probably group treatments, particularly dairy calves, recovering from calf diarrhea or other upsets, 50 mils daily in milk per calf for five to seven days. And I think, as I probably stressed, hopefully, long-term usage uh, as we continue to develop. And we go into each market looking at studies and looking at comparisons so that we have some really interesting trials going on in the UK at the moment. Uh, and they're nearly finished again, again, showing the value of the product in long-term use. Um, so really, really, I think I'm coming to the end. I have to throw in a horse slide here for anyone who is watching this webinar with a horse. Our equine complementary feed um, is, uh, again, a really fascinating product. When you think about the horse formulation, it's completely different. They're hind gut fermenters, um, hugely challenged by diet change, dysbiosis and inflammation, can be hard to diagnose, but we've really seen some massive benefits ongoing with long-term use, particularly in high-performance horses or horses under stress. This is a product that people are going to hear about if you've got horses because it is really revolutionary, um, particularly daily. It's palatable. Um, uh, we've got lots of people using it, just getting gut homeostasis, particularly in the hindgut, right with this complementary feed. Really exciting product. 
These are our most famous customers. We're only launched the horse market for eight months, the Spanish Riding School in Vienna. Um, really, really interesting. So watch out for precision microbes. Uh, I suppose I've talked about calves briefly. Uh, I've talked about calves in detail briefly mentioned um, horses but we've such a range of products and the microbes roles and the different formulations we've a stable of microbial uh, solutions and the blends that are there absolutely fascinating i'm extremely enthusiastic about it people who've listened to me maybe before said tommy you're enthusiastic about all sorts of things but i am i think it's been um really really exciting for me to work with this team and see what we've got coming next the advanced gut stabilizers you know products to working on lambs different you know we're not standing still i mean we have a whole range of stuff coming through um, and again it's harnessing the power of nature quite extraordinary really um okay i hope i've explained why we still must get the be brilliant at the basics and i think that's in everything we do in life um, and try and do our best it's impossible to always get things right but consistency around those six pillars will always deliver better calf health better calf health in your pre weaned calf will mean healthier calves and better future lifetime performance less disease less infection less antibiotics more profitability that's the key message there when we look at the challenges and what we can do um, the gut microbiome is a fascinating area of research all disease begins in the gut hippocrates says i think all health begins in the gut so we need to focus on better gut health and using the unique liquid pro and postbiotic liquids we're delivering those results we can get those calves with diarrhea back on track and um, we can get the groups of calves it's very palatable in milk but the possibility i think in all your own calving systems is the long-term usage so looking forward to i suppose going to other markets again hearing those stories building um, um on what we've done in, in ireland and other markets now um, and really delivering results for better calf health for farmers better results on on farm and um, look i i have said it once twice and maybe this is the third or fourth time but i think these uh, microbes are game changing in their application uh, i would really like to thank everybody who has listened in it's probably been a bit longer than you expected to the webinar tonight um happy safe farming everybody keep up the good work it's challenging times out there i know it is i'm listening and talking to people all the time um, just control what you can control on farm um, try and you know be consistent in your approach and um, leave as many challenges as you can outside the farm outside the house door and leave them in the farmyard and um, you know progress over perfection keep going forward and i think hopefully precision microbes will be a part of that story for so many farms um, around you know making progress around calf health take care and stay safe